I welcome you to a fascinating event. I'm Joachim von Braun. I'm a vice chair of the Board of Gain. It gives me immense pleasure to be in London. And uh, if I look back coming down uh, from my room, I thought, how many times have I been in London this year and last year? And it is within Europe the most frequently visited place for me. Why is that so? Because this is where the action is. I'm a development economist interested in food and nutrition, and I wish that it continues to be the place where the action is. And uh, Lawrence, you and your team certainly are uh, a fabulous addition uh, to make London the place, besides Geneva, uh, where the action of nutrition is. With, uh, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. I'm asked to briefly introduce uh, the panel <coughs> and uh, then hand over to Lawrence, who will orchestrate the panel discussion. And in the end, uh, Vinita, our board chair, will make some uh, words of wisdom uh, closing the event. Um, asking the professor to make a few remarks. Um, uh, you will regret, Lawrence, uh, because I will give now my speech, uh, my lecture. It's time to give me the mic now. No, uh, colleagues, uh, um, we have a topic about which um, um, we have discussed in today's Partnership Council, which is a key advisory body of the Board of Gain. Um, in great detail and with uh, considerable excitement. How to strengthen the quality of engagement between government and businesses to improve the quality of diets. So you heard quality twice. Quality of engagement between business and uh, uh, governments to improve the quality of diets. Hidden in there is um, the key theme of uh, GAIN's new strategy, emerging new strategy, improving the quality of diets. I'm sure Lawrence will uh, infiltrate the debate with elements of the uh, uh, very promising new strategy. <clears throat> Let me make one other point. When you look at um, uh, what government and governance does to nutrition, a few statistics stand out in stark ways. Um, reducing corruption does improve, holding other things constant does improve nutrition. Increasing voice and accountability, another very important governance indicator, holding other things uh, constant does improve nutrition. So we need movement on the government side and not only on the business side in order to move forward together to new creative alliances. <coughs> um, private sector um, has substantial potential say Michael Reich and Jarulini uh, Balarajan in um, an article in The Lancet uh, last year. But Norman Borlaug came, to, uh, came often to meetings by saying, potentials is great, but you cannot eat potentials. Uh, this was the famous wheat breeder. Yeah? So um, that potential needs to be tapped. Um, but uh, the two authors I just quoted uh, also continue their sentences by saying, uh, but uh, scarcity of credible evidence of, govern of uh, the private sector's potential to improve nutrition is also a problem. So I think GAIN um, can play a key role to um, facilitate improved uh, government engagement improved governance related uh, to nutrition and in general, and the private sector. So uh, the two need to move together. 
Um, and um, um, we believe that gain can play a key role to facilitate that uh, increased uh, togetherness. Having praised London as a place of nutrition business and uh, business and nutrition with government, I want to welcome you all from private sector and um, um, the public sector. But I also happen to believe that civil society organizations have a key role to play in supporting uh, that uh, togetherness. This is um, for me also an occasion uh, to uh, applaud you, Lawrence, for your leadership, um, for your uh, bold, uh, creative, and uh, intellectual uh, steps which you have taken to move gain to new levels. Um, and um, it's a moment to thank you for that. Um, this is your home turf, but uh, you don't need home turf. You have been um, a ph phenomenal player in Washington and uh, now in Geneva and uh, of course in Sussex before. So um, I wish you personally best of luck. Uh, and um, we in the board are very pleased to have you. Thank you all, and I ask you for a round of applause now um, for Lawrence, who will step up first, <laughs> followed by Beverly Ostma, Chief Executive Officer from Harvest Plus. Harvest Plus is, um, uh, those are the bio fortifiers, yeah? Uh, <laughs> breeding uh, the good stuff into, into the crops. Um, Okay. Ade Wimpe, Ade Bije, please come up. Um, is the Director of Family Health, Ministry of Health, Nigeria. Welcome at the uh, table. Lauren Landis, Director of Nutrition, World Food Program. Um, Lauren, this is also a great sign because it has not been for a long time that WFP has a nutrition a directorate. Um, so we applaud your organization. And um, uh, I ask uh, Opai Asiri Nkia to the table. <laughs> Opai is uh, in the Prime Minister's office uh, in the uh, United Re Republic of Tanzania. And there he is in charge of bringing uh, public and uh, uh, private sector together. So uh, he knows what he's talking about uh, when bringing together uh, public and private to new alliances. Mauricio Adade, president of BSM, Latin America. Mauricio, thank you uh, for joining this panel. Uh, you see uh, how global hemispheric um, gain is. Um, all corners of the world are there except mm -hmm. the Arctic. Uh, so, Lawrence, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Joachim, thank you so much. Um, you always seem to have an ability to pick exactly the right word. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. London is my home. I grew up in London and I'm very proud of the spirit and the resilience of the people of London in the wake of the terrible events uh, of a couple of days ago. I'm also um, very proud of the vibrancy uh, of the intellectual debate and the dynamism of the nutrition actors in London. It's, a, it's an incredible place to be and uh, I'm very glad that GAIN has a, has a, has a key office in, in London. Um, when I was, when we were designing this event, I should say thank you for coming. Um, it's probably the end of a long day for most of you, and uh, I hope we live up to your expectations. I'm sure we will. When we were designing this event, um, one of my comms gurus said to me, "You do realise, Lawrence, the word quality is is in the title twice, and that's kind of not a very good thing to have in the title." And we said, yeah, but it's for the reasons that Joachim mentioned. We feel like there is some kind of link between the quality of engagement, 
between public and private, uh, and the quality of diets. Why do we think that? The quality of diets, why is that such a big deal? Those of you who have heard me speak about this will be sick to death of hearing me say this, but we know one, that one in three people in this world have a really bad diet, at least, probably more. We know that diet is the number one uh, risk factor in the global burden of disease. If you look at the top 11 factors, six of the top 11 are related to diet in one way or another. We know that what determines diet, a lot of the elements are in the food system. Other things matter, of course, for diet too, but a lot of it is found in the food system. Everything from agriculture and inputs to agriculture, as Fritz reminded me, inputs to agriculture, agricultural production, um, production, distribution, retail, marketing, storage, you name it. Everything from what you put in the ground to what you put in your mouth. And what's at the heart of food systems? Businesses. Businesses, one way or another, are at the heart of food systems. Yes, there are consumer associations. Yes, government is very important for regulating and setting the rules and trying to enforce the rules. Um, yes, um, other, other actors are important. But ultimately, there is no food system without businesses. So if we're interested in shaping diets, changing diets, getting people to increase the demand for healthier food, making healthier food more affordable, creating an environment where it's easier for businesses and consumers to demand that and, and provide that, then we have to engage with businesses. And yet, we know that this is quite a fraught territory we're in, nutrition and business. We know that on the one hand, there are people who think business can do everything brilliantly in nutrition and the public sector is really terrible at doing stuff. Then there are people who think, actually, business has no business to be in nutrition. It should all be public sector. But I think the vast majority of us are in the middle somewhere. And I, that's certainly where I am and many of my game colleagues are. We're trying to figure out not whether to engage, but when to engage and how to engage and why to engage or where to engage. And that's really the, the, the theme of tonight. Um, what opportunities are we missing by not engaging with the, between public and private sectors? And how do we do that? What's the best, what do we need to be able to make it a safe, productive thing for nutrition? The downsides are quite serious if we get it wrong for nutrition and the upsides are potentially huge. So how can we navigate that terrain? What, what information do we need? What evidence do we need? What tools do we need? What approaches? What mindsets? And what partnerships do we need? So this is these are the kind of exam questions that we've asked our fantastic panel, who are all members of the GAIN Partnership Council. I know they're very opinionated, because they've just been giving me their opinions about the new strategy for the last four and a half hours. Um, so I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that didn't wear them out. Um, we've asked them to do two things in their five minutes and then I will stop talking. The first thing is to talk about one or two key opportunities that we think might be missed by a, a lack of engagement between public and private, and then to talk a little bit about what, what's needed to improve the quality of that engagement um, from the various contexts that they're in. So without further ado, we'll do that. We'll ask them each to spend five minutes talking, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for a Q&A with you guys. And the same questions. What are the opportunities we're missing what needs to happen to improve the quality of engagement? We know it's all context specific, so tell us what context you're speaking from when you when you have the floor. I think maybe we should start from from Lauren and work this way, if that's okay with you, Lauren. Good evening, and um, I'm not only honored to get to go first, but I'm honored to be here. Um, I had a, a bit of a presentation prepared when I got on the plane, and after today's very vibrant discussion, I abandoned it completely. <laughs> um, so I, I guess what I'd like to do tonight is just maybe tell you a little bit of a story of how I see these questions evolving in, in the World Food Program, and therefore I, where I see it's leading us in, in opportunities for working with the private sector. So I guess what I want to say is, uh, of maybe even all the UN agencies, the World Food Program has a culture of working with the private sector, probably more so uh, 
than many UN agencies that you know very well. And this has developed over time. If you look at the World Food Program maybe 50 years ago, we were all about in-kind food aid. But we still had to transport it around the world. We had to use, you know, we had to use the private sector for ships and trucks and even donkeys and elephants as well as processing uh, that food, storage of that food. So we, we had already knew we couldn't do it without the private sector in one form or another. If you looked at about 10 years ago, all that in-kind food aid had gone away, and we we're really buying internationally. Um, and we were starting to think about, and starting to think about it with DSM, about how we create specialized nutrition products that would, it's not just so much about how many calories you can put in people's mouths, but getting those right nutrients, and particularly for children. So we started to look at how could we internationally develop the right formula and nutrient mixes to get that, uh, that nutrition to children. But if you move up, because I know I only got five minutes, if you move up very quickly, fast forward to 2015, I'll throw some numbers at you, um, and mostly what you'll take from them is it's big, right? The World Food Program bought $1.1 billion of food. But now in 2015, we're saying that 800, uh, 781 million of it came from developing nations and often from smallholder farmers. So this is where you see us moving from food aid to food assistance, and folk moving away from international players and getting a real mandate that we need to look at local procurement and we need to look at working with local businesses and smallholders. So still needing local transport, local processing, local fortification if possible, storage, et cetera. And what we found is that we were buying from 79, I think in 2015, 79 different countries. And we were finding that our demand could actually create a market for smallholder farmers. So by promising to procure, we could build even more uh, work with the, the private sector. <coughs> Now, if you fast forward to where we're going now with a new nutrition policy, a new nutrition division, um, not only are we buying more food locally, but now we're moving into cash and vouchers. Ooh, what does this mean for nutrition, right? So this means now we hand cash and people can go to a lar local market and we need to encourage them to buy nutritional products, let's hope they exist, and we need the nutrition education to encourage them of what they should buy, because of course they have lots of choices out there. So now we see ourselves focus much more on diets, and um, we, we need more local options, particularly for those, uh, those under twos, for that first thousand days, or for those complementary foods, in those early years. So now we're in a new place. We're definitely into food assistance, but we gotta look at what can we do to encourage that local procurement um, of those products. And I know uh, Maurizio is gonna talk about it, but one of the things that we've been very proud of is, and I'll, I won't spoil his fire, but uh, we did buy 11,800 metric tons of super cereal uh, plus produced in Rwanda this year. So, and we have a promise, which he will tell you about, to do a lot more of that. So really bringing even that local procurement of uh, specialized nutrition products to, uh, to local uh, players and to the private sector. So it's not, it's not completely huge, but you can see where the potential is going. So I think in 2015, we bought 230,000 metric tons. So 11,000 metric tons isn't so great, but it really shows the potential and the nature of where we're going. So to not spoil my five minutes, I have three conclusions. Um, we've built our engagement with the private sector as we've moved from food aid to food assistance. 
now that the World Food Program is trying to move a little bit, and hopefully quickly, beyond just calories, more to nutrients, with a nutrient focus, our relation with the private sector has to change and hopefully be enhanced in a very positive, responsible way. Um, so we see, for example, a real uh, increased role in uh, the Sun Business Network, which we co-chair uh, with GAIN and really wanting to take that on. And that demand to do that is not coming from Rome. That's coming from our offices in the field, and that's something that we've been talking about today to encourage. Um, and then, in order to buy our nutrition products more locally, what we've got to think about is in the same way we used our demand to bring that procurement of general food more locally, can we use our demand of specialized nutrition products to also encourage that relationship with the, um, with the private sector locally? Homegrown school feeding, if some of you know the, the term, is where we actually encourage farmers to produce local, a balanced, nutritional, a nutritious uh, food basket for children in school. Can we use that in other ways? We're looking very much at rice fortification. Can we use that as well to encourage a demand uh, uh, for more healthy and affordable food? And then, what can we do to encourage that 11,000 metric tons in terms of those uh, specialized nutrition products? I think we see a lot of positive avenues working with the private sector in that way, but in a very careful and responsive way. Uh, because, of course, there are uh, many, uh, we talked about them today, many uh, challenges to make sure that we're working with the good partners and working on the good products and not finding ourselves uh, in, in so, shall we say, the dangerous territories. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Lauren. And um, we, we should acknowledge WFP is, has been a real leader within the UN mm. on engaging with business. Yes. I think you've been quite brave mm. to do that. And if I were in the audience, I'd want to know how, how much trouble does that get you in with WHO? <laughs> But we can, I'll, I'll let the audience ask that question. Thank you, Lauren, that's great. I'm ready for that. Good, that's great. Pimpe, over to you. Good evening, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and uh, my co panelists. Uh, coming from the background of overseeing the continuum of care for the family, reproductive, maternal, adolescent, elderly which includes nutrition all the way. I say I'm very delighted to be part of this um, panel this evening, and as particularly delighted because I'm being part of nurturing and cultivating areas of strengthening partnerships to bring quality to food from the farm to the table. Um, what's the rationale behind all of this? First, we need the right investments in food production. We need to have robust partnerships. There are over 800 million people in the sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, that are actually um, undernourished. They consume less than the minimum dietary energy needs. And over two billion people uh, suffer from what is uh, adverse effects of obese obesity. And we have the problem of contamination of foods. We have the problem of malnutrition and foodborne diseases. And what should government be doing as a responsibility to address all of this? I believe that is where the businesses and the 
um, and government should begin to explore and foster partnerships. Particularly in Nigeria, I would want to gladly inform us that we have been celebrating our food fortification uh, program, especially the universal salt iodization since 2005. How did we get this? We had a um, shared objective between the businesses and the and government. There was mutual accountability. There was observation of the principles of partnership. Partnership is partnership. You don't uh, say you are partnering with somebody and you are self-centered. Uh, we respect partnership. <clears throat> and another success story that we have is the National Food Fortification Alliance, which is an alliance that brought together the industry and government. Food fortification is well known in Nigeria. And um, the in the wake of the insurgency in Nigeria, we also saw government declaring nutrition emergency and brought in um, stakeholders, including the private sector, businesses, to partner with government in responding, emergency response on nutrition and health. Similarly, the federal government of Nigeria is responding to the prevailing fiscal environment by developing the economic recovery and growth plan. This plan focuses on restoring <coughs> micro and macro economic resilience and enhanced engagements. It is in our quest to ensure availability of quality of diet in Nigeria that the government recently approved and launched the multi-sectoral national policy on food and nutrition. This provides the framework for addressing Nigeria's malnutrition challenge from the individual to the household and community and at the national level. We also have the National Strategic Plan of Action on Nutrition, the NSPAN, which actually sets out costed nutrition specific interventions. Um, we also have the Young and Child Nutrition National Strategy for Infant and Young Child Nutrition in Nigeria, which is anchored on strategic thrusts, including prevention of child malnutrition, promotion of inclusive, transparent and nutrition governance, and strengthening multi-stakeholder platforms in the states and the community levels. Creating an enabling environment for business in Nigeria is one specific reform that government is actually undergoing. And it goes to say that we want to ensure reforms that makes it easy and simple for processes to put them into practice thereby making the business environment more competitive. We really want businesses to be competitive in Nigeria and the food um, nutrition space is not left out. Facilitating ex existing businesses to thrive by entry and exit of people and goods, simplifying government procurement processes, and improving transparency by articulating clear service level agreements for permits, documents, and licenses, and um, specific approaches to business engagement that I want to uh, prefer there should be availability of farm produce, which is germane to ensuring movement of good quality 
food from the farm to the table, how can this happen? First, by human capital development, provision of a range of public goods and services is imperative for the private sector and general economic growth. There should be vocational training, education and health services which improve the quality of the labor force, social insurance that may improve the operation of the labor market, road constructions and rehabilitation that improve access to the markets, and very importantly, availability of arable land and appropriate technology to support food security. Development partners such as GAIN have several roles to play, particularly in information sharing, transfer of technology, building partnerships for development, initiating and engaging in advocacy for policy development and strategic planning. And uh, for want of time, let me conclude I'm by saying, at you. So, yeah. <laughs> let me conclude by saying, continuous and strategic engagements of businesses is a veritable strategy through which safe, nutritious diets can be secured for the low income population, especially the vulnerable groups. Thank you. Thank you, Pimpe. I, I took three uh, important points. There were many more important points, but the three I took away were, it's not all about food systems. Food systems have to interact with other systems like health systems, so you're from the health system. Second, you, you actually outlined some principles about partnership, shared, shared objectives, mutual accountability, and uh, partnership means don't be self-centered. It means put yourself in the other person's shoes and think about what they want to get out of this partnership. And the third thing I thought was really pertinent was you said the government is really thinking about how to make an enabling environment for businesses to, to be competitive. What can we do to make that those efforts more nutrition sensitive? So great contributions. Thank you. Um, let me pass it over now to Beth. Thank you very much. And uh, wow, it's a hard act to follow. Um, it, it's always a pleasure to come to London. Um, it's my home, my home country. I haven't lived here for 15 years, but this year it feels even more important to, to be here right this week. Um, like Lauren, I, I have uh, spent a, a remarkable day with some remarkable people. And uh, I popped over to the bar and I retyped my notes <laughs> for today. So, so bear with me. Um, we, we've had the most amazing interaction. And Lawrence has given us some guidance on, on sharing some insights on, on what, what it takes to have a, a quality conversation about quality partnerships. So um, I, I've had the fortune of, of, over the last 20 years, working on both sides of the public-private divide. Uh, I don't use that word lightly. Um, but I've learned the hard way what unites us and what divides us, especially in the field of nutrition. And I think it's, it's particularly poignant that we're sitting here in London with a multicultural panel talking about a global issue that requires partnership to solve. And I, I think it's a very special panel to have here today on a very, very special week. What I've learned is that there are no silver bullets when it comes to partnership or solving difficult problems. And so all I can do is maybe share a few takeaways um, from my own experiences. Um, I've, I've got things wrong, I've made mistakes, um, but I have been fortunate to broker a few successful multi-stakeholder partnerships. And, uh, and I, I found four things. I, your mentor only shared three. So apparently you'll only remember three, but I'm going to give you four. So maybe you'll remember three of the four. My, my first one is that you need a coalition of the willing in order to, to have a, a successful partnership. All partnerships are built on mutual trust and commitment. And when you trace most successful partnerships back to their roots, you often find this very small selective group of companies and individuals that were there right from the beginning. I mean, it's great having Anne Hewen sitting here from Unilever because if I go back, uh, I'm not going to mention how many years, Anne, but if I go back, um, there was a group called the Fast Track 7 in the food industry, and it, it took five companies to break away 
from their trade association to say, no, we're going to do things differently. We're going to make a commitment to nutrition. And, and if it hadn't been for those, those, those seven companies that decided to break from the pack, then we wouldn't have made, and they wouldn't have made the, the, the strides they made in nutrition. So I think it's very important that it's okay to be selective in choosing the actors at the beginning of a public-private partnership. It's not like planning your wedding. You, you don't have to worry about ego or status and having all the cousins at the right table. It's far more important to single out the most willing and the most committed at the beginning and urge them to lay down the framework for dialogue that others can then join. And that's difficult in public-private partnership because we want everyone to have a fair voice. But I think having that coalition of the willing is my, my number one takeout. The second takeaway is you need an honest broker in any partnership, especially for very complex and competitive issues like nutrition and agriculture, which are the fields that, that I've, I've uh, had the pleasure of being involved in. The existence of a very strong convener or a trusted agent, a trusted broker is vital. Um, all parties at the table need to trust the convener to hold everyone to account and also to arbitrate some of the more difficult conversations that are, that are inevitable in, in global issues. In many instances, I've found that the success of partnership lies and rests on the shoulder of actually just one unique individual human being. And I truly believe that you need a change maker to make partnership successful. We all know who they are. I have one sitting to my left. <laughs> they are the servant leaders in our global communities. They're able to inspire others and cut through complexity and drive towards positive momentum. And I don't say those things lightly. They are unique individuals that can achieve that. I'm not going to give you extra time okay. for saying that. But we need, to, we need to rally behind them. You know, they're, they're usually not egos. They're usually people that we need to rally behind. And they're the role models and champions of public-private partnership. My third lesson, I might run out, might only be able to say three. My, my third is, I call it the 60-40 the rule. And I think I learned this the hard way. Too many public-private partnerships try, they, they fail because they try to align on everything. They try to find full consensus at the table. And, and they get hung up on a small number of very difficult issues and fail to focus on the things that actually unite them. How often have we sat and spent a whole meeting arguing about the things that divide us and fail to have a conversation about the things we can agree on? So from the outset of any partnership, it's so important to lay down that shared goal, that one thing that we're all at the table for. What brought us to the table in the first place? Set it down, write it down, write it on a great big cloud and put it on the wall. Because believe me, it gets forgotten fairly early on in any relationship when you have public and private actors at the table. You then have to have a very frank conversation about the motivations, the different motivations around the table. And it's okay, as long as you remember what you all agree on, it's really okay to, to have different individual motivations and objectives. Um, There'll be some issues where consensus is not going to be possible. And we all know the common derailers when it comes to nutrition between governments and companies. And these, these derailers, these differences, are sometimes cited as conflict of interest, and sometimes they are, and you have to walk away. But in some instances, they're just merely fundamental differences in motivation. A company needs to be able to make a profit and market its products at the end of the day. And they often have to be quite selective about the demographic that they're targeting in achieving that objective. A government, on the other hand, has to always put the interests of its entire constituency first, regardless of income or, or geography. Now, in these situations, 
all parties have to decide whether they can put aside the 40% of things that they can't rely on in favour to focus on the 60% of things that they can. And it's a failure point for many partnerships, but if you can get past that, there's a tremendous opportunity that lies ahead of us. My fourth thing, if I have time for one more, um, it's, it's something I've learned the hard way, personally and institutionally, but it's to put aside any institutional or personal ego and focus on the bigger win. Eight months ago, I, I had this remarkable honor of meeting one of the humblest leaders that I know in public-private partnership. Dr. Howdy Buis is the founder of Harvest Plus. He, he's one of the recipients of last year's World Food Prize for his role in pioneering this remarkable gift of biofortification. If you don't know what it is, Google it. It's seven syllables, and it's taken me seven months to learn how to say it uh, without, without stumbling. But thanks to Howdy's utter belief in public-private partnership, this small program, Harvest Plus, we're far greater than the sum of our parts. We have 170 staff, but over 200 partners, including Nigeria, Tanzania, and the World Food Program. Um, we're already reaching, reaching 20 million people, rural farmers and their families with more nutritious food crops. And the evidence is simply remarkable. We're already recording 50% reduction in childhood diarrheal diseases in Africa. We're seeing total reversal of iron deficiency in women and rapid improvements in night vision and cognitive performance in rural children in Africa and Asia. Just by swapping their regular food crops like wheat and corn and cassava, for a bio-fortified version, a more nutritious version that has higher natural levels of iron, zinc, and vitamin A. Now, as our program continues to grow and we enter this final scaling stage of our journey, our and my biggest challenge will be to retain the humility and the lack of ego of our founder. You see, in order to reach our goal, of reaching a billion people by 2030. Harvest Plus needs to shun fame. We need to be prepared to partner with a huge number of governments and companies and organizations like GAIN who share our goal of eliminating malnutrition and hidden hunger. This problem is far too big to solve on our own. So my take home is that good quality partnerships are like good quality diets. They're not just an option for the few. They're an imperative for the many. Thank you very much. Great, Biff. Thank you. That's great. And I, I, I really liked your four points. And um, I think at some stage in the q and it'd be great to hear what kinds of challenges you're facing in getting from the 20 moving towards the billion in terms of engaging the private sector. That'd be great. So thank you for that. Now I turn to Obey. And can I have your mic? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, no, thank you everybody. Um, I'll start by giving you a very funny thing in most of the national parks in Tanzania. There is an, an animal which thinks it's bad. <coughs> It's always hide its head down there and leave the whole body outside. And to me, that's the mistake we'll be doing if we don't engage the private sector mm -hmm. in the nutritious diet. Because the private sector does almost everything in the food system value chain. It produces, it processes, it distributes in itself. So I think to me, if we don't engage this sector which does it in everything, we are missing the opportunity to bring the quality food in the market and therefore compromising the nutrition of our population. So that, that's the first thing I would like to mention. The second, we'll be missing the opportunity of even those one who are willing to do that. You know, there are, in the, in the market there's private sector which is willing to engage in the nutrition, provided you use the right strategy to bring them in the market. In the, in the partnership. And what we did in Tanzania when we were formulating our multi-sectoral platform, we brought in the private sector 
one of the biggest miller in Tanzania. And people are saying, will they come in the platform? But what we saw, they were very happy. They were coming. One time when we were launching one of our strategies, we approached them, so can you contribute for the government? They contributed quite good money. And they are willing, they are coming, they are engaging. And they are able now to influence others. So if we don't engage, identify champion and engage, we are missing the opportunity of expanding the, you know, the, 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 the private sector engagement. So to do that, uh, we should, the government should create environment that is right for the private sector to operate, not only in the food industry, but on the whole sphere of the private sector. And specifically now, you can zero down to the diet-related private sector. That will include setting standards, putting policies, um, laws and regulation, and enforce them in a way that allow everybody to, to participate and avoid double standard. <coughs> Treat the private sector equally. You know, some of the mistake we do is to say maybe this, uh, for example, in food fortification, only large producers should fortify at a certain stage. But we have so many SM, S, SME in the market which are producing and supply a lot of food. So how do you bring them also to avoid double standard? Because in the long run, those who are not fortifying, they, they don't see the incentive of doing if others are not doing. So how do you avoid double standard? It's, it's not easy, but it's challenging. In doing that environment, you should also define what is the really, what is the private good and what is the public good. Identify clearly what should the private sector do and what can do it efficiently, what they should public sector do. And in such a way, we can now create the complementarities. If we don't <coughs> identify clearly, you will miss the, the opportunity. Then you, we need to see not only engaging the private sector in the food system sphere, you should engage others. You know, the media, for example, is a private sector a good most of the places. So how do you engage them to be able to send the right information? How do you make them to be part and parcel of improving the food system? Telecommunication companies, which is, you know, if the tool is it's working strongly in Africa now, how do you make them to be your partner? How do you engage them? So you should widen and expand the engagement and partnership in a way that really creates an opportunity for everybody to operate and give them the space to operate. So in doing that, the quality, two qualities in your thing is are very important, that the quality engagement contributes to the quality diet, among other factors, of course, but that one really includes, so they are, they, they, they are very important for, for, for the one to determine the other to contribute. So my, my, my very quick um, four issues I would like to say in summary. If you want to um, engage, to improve the quality of engagement, one, use the right platforms, private sector platforms that is existing, to be like your partners of bringing them to engagement. They are there, they exist. There are foundations, there are you know, network of the private sector which can be big or small, you, you need to engage. So the right platform to me is very, very critical. You said it, identify the champions in all areas, in the government, in the private sector. Who can be the champion? Who can listen to you and spread the gospel, if I can use that word? Create the level play. I, I am repeating it, I'm just emphasizing. Make sure the, 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 the environment which is there is conducive for every private sector to operate without double standard, minimize that. And the fourth one, provide incentive <coughs> awareness. That will include physical incentive for private sector to see it as a good thing. In such a way, we'll be creating the private sector not only for profit, but to contribute in improving that. Thank you. Thank you, Obey. Um, Really interesting. I, 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 just two things I, I picked out from your short but rich um, presentation. One is, it's not just about food businesses. It's about other, other businesses that can 
influence demand, we need supply, so it's about media, it's about logistics, it's about refrigeration, it's about uh, telecoms, it's about all, all those kinds of businesses. Um, I think the other thing, um, the, other, the other question that was raised in my mind, and I think Bimpe also mentioned this, was you both said you know, government has a role to play here in sort of enforcing and setting standards, but what about the capacity to enforce and the capacity to monitor? So I'd like to come back to that at some stage in the Q&A. But uh, over to you, Mauricio. Thank you very much. Um, a real honor to be sitting here today. By the end of this day, 10,000 mothers will see their babies dying in their arms because of malnutrition. It does not have to be like that. And uh, the famous PPPs, the triple P, the uh, public and private partnerships, can help it. I said this afternoon, and I repeat here, uh, we should add to the PPP another word, that is E, make it effective. Because there are many public and private initiatives that at the end of the day, they really struggle to be effective. And this is one of the questions we have been hearing for this panelist today, how to make it effective. Allow me to, to bring some perspective from the private sector. I think that I will not repeat what has been said here because it's already uh, rich of, of um, uh, content what has been discussed. But one thing that's quite important is to involve all the partners at the beginning of the process. Um, I remember many years back when I was living in Mexico and then um, we have started the program of fortifying um, the uh, corn flour, the corn uh, um, to, produ to produce the tortillas fortifying with folic acid because uh, we needed to um, do something about the uh, neurotubid effects. And after three years of working together uh, between academia and the government, then the government decided to bring in the industry. And it took another three years to make it a reality. So from that perspective, it's quite important to really get all the partners together at the very beginning, bring them to the table. Somebody said this today, it's quite important to have a voice that is represented in the table. The second element is that sometimes some people say malnutrition happens, but not here. Big mistake. Malnutrition is happening almost everywhere in the world in different forms. Uh, the famous dilemma between overweight and the lack of nutrients or micronutrients. So we have to be careful not to label and say that I mean we only have to tackle malnutrition in some places in the world, normally the developing countries. The food industry and the industry itself plays an important role there. I think that um, uh, we sometimes forget that the industry can bring technology, research, can bring innovation, the distribution channels, communication, that some, sometimes we just forget how do we bring awareness. And I think this is some of the elements that the industry can bring. Um, on top of, of um, also every day growing within the industry the sense of social responsibility. So let's make sure that we take this and also make it sustainable because sometimes sustainability is not part of all the partnerships. We talk about quality, uh, but we have not mentioned something very basic, quality of the products. Many, pro many programs start and I think it's a great, uh, a great programs. However, if I just take one example of um, the wrong micronutrients or the wrong bioavailability or the wrong stability of the micronutrients that are added. And then we end up after a couple of months, a couple of years, measuring the impact and the impact is not there. So I think it's quite important, something that we should not forget. Another thing is clear accountability. Clear accountability and the definition of roles. Everyone and we have here would have heard today, I mean, how important it is to, from the beginning, understand that everybody has a role and we should voice it up, not making these gray areas, because then it's so difficult to, 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 to define. And the other thing is having metrics. What is measured is done. So make sure that there, there are clear objectives that you need to measure. Uh, otherwise, I think that we cannot prove that this has been successful. I want to bring you one example that is very close to my heart and is um, also very recent. This is the reason why I want to 
um, mention it. And it has already been mentioned. Um, um, I just came from Rwanda. I was uh, last week in Rwanda where we have uh, made a um, ceremony of uh, inaugurating officially Africa Improved Foods. And Africa Improved Foods is an example. I cannot say to you that it's successful yet because it's very new. But it's an idea that started in 2013 and now it's taking place in Rwanda. And this is a combination of having the government of Rwanda inviting the private initiative and the public initiative to do something to tackle one of the most important malnutrition issues we have that is stunting. 38% of the population, uh, the kids in, 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 in Rwanda, they are stunted. So for, for, for taking this in consideration, what has been uh, done is a combination of uh, the private initiative, DSM in this case, together with the World Food Program, and uh, three development banks, World, Food, World Bank, the Development Bank of UK, Development Bank of the Netherlands, that invest uh, around 60 million US dollars in a brand new factory to produce the so-called Super Serial Plus. Super Serial Plus. <laughs> you see, this is what you talk about partnership. Super Serial Plus, that is a, uh, a excellent source for pregnant and lactating, lactating women and also for toddlers that gives the right amounts of micronutrients, also uh, in regards of macronutrients as well. So from that perspective, uh, the factory has is, is been working now, and as you can imagine, um, not an easy task to put a factory like that um, operational with the high standards of quality and also innovation. Um, and we are serving now the kids, not only in Rwanda, the pregnant women, not only in Rwanda, but also in the region. So local for local. But more important, we are taking the raw material for more than 9,000 smallholder farmers, corn that they produce, and we are enhancing their capacities and the capabilities of enhancing the quality, quality of raw materials that is needed for producing this porridge. So I still keep very close to my heart. I was visiting the farmers last week, and among the farmers there were two women with the babies in, in their arms. And they were so proud to know that the corn that they are producing and harvesting is coming back to them via the health centers and is giving to their kids a better opportunity, better nutrition, and a better life. So just to conclude, and I know that you look at me like that, um, it's not two, it's not three, it's not 10, I have just one. I think in order to be successful, we need to have two elements, a vision and resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mauricio, that was great. A couple of things that I picked up on what you said. Um, you said there's a growing sense of social responsibility amongst businesses. I think we should dig into that a little bit more. Why is that happening and what does that mean? Uh, is it really happening? Do others think it's happening? And the other thing you said was PPP need to be effective. So what does effective mean? And, and who gets to do the evaluation? So your Super Serial Plus, I really hope you're gonna do a good impact evaluation of it, so that we won't have to rely on you telling us how wonderful it is. We can get someone else to tell us how wonderful it is. Um, guys, uh, we've gone over a little bit of the time that we, we said we would, we, we started about 15 minutes late. So if you would indulge us, we've got about 25 minutes for Q&A. So I'd like to invite you to, to make some comments, questions from the floor. And panelists, should we take three at a time, is that all right? And you respond to whichever ones you want to respond. I'll, I'll make sure that all of them are addressed. And could you just say who you are? Yes, um, you are. I'm Anushri. Um, I work as the Policy Advocacy Officer for Results UK. Um, if I completely agree with everyone on the panel that we need to work, um, engage in effective uh, quality partnerships with the private sector. Um, if we want to see the kind of gains in tackling malnutrition that we want, I thought the panel generally spoke about, say, uh, issues like fortification, biofortification, supply chains, which haven't really been, I, I feel that those aren't really the problematic areas. Um, we broadly agree that by, there's evidence to show biofortification, fortification, uh, the cost effectiveness and the impact on nutrition. The problem comes in communicating 
the transparency and accountability on on the other spectrum of malnutrition, on, on overweight, obesity, and what is being done to tackle that. And I feel there's not enough a uh, promotion of awareness of the positives of the private sector in tackling malnutrition, um, and be in what they are doing to um, to improve on this image of the private sector that they are that they are not helping the NCD uh, crisis that is also exploding. So, so you think they are doing more than they're getting credit for to improve? I I to don't address. know because there isn't enough awareness around what is being done and transparency around what they're doing. Okay, okay. thank you, Anishri. Let's take a couple more comments. Dr. Brees, the clerk with the, with the Foundation. Thanks, thanks for that. That was all, all fantastic. And I think a really nice example of how PPPs can, can work together. One, one of the things that we've been doing at EAT is working with the CIA uh, the Culinary Institute of America, the, the first one, yet <laughs> the, yeah, the other one. And one of the things that Craig Drescher always highlights when he gives his presentations on, on uh, engaging with uh, academia and the, uh, the public sector is that it has to be delicious. And so it's a very different approach. I'm a little bit surprised that here we've talked quite a bit about food and nutrition, and we've talked about fortification, and we've talked about uh, staples and cereals, but we haven't talked about uh, delicious food. Or, or thinking anything beyond some of these basic needs. So does this play at all the kind of things that you guys are working on? How does it play in there? And uh, what are some of the strategies for bringing that into uh, our work as well? Great question, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add something to the Super Cereals Plus um, that was mentioned at the end. I just wondered if finger millet is being included in that when you talk about the cereals, because it is very naturally high in, in calcium and was a traditional weaning food and, and he's still in Ireland and places like that. So it's one of those grains that we don't think about, of course, because of the, the ones that are more commonly thought of. Um, so I just wanted to think of what it was being considered. Okay, thank you. Let's get down. Um, keep going, um, guys. We'll keep going with And you are representing Collaboration for Health today, which is mainly on the global side of NCDs. Um, I just wondered from my years of working in food and nutrition policy, what role time should play in the partnerships. Um, you know, I, I sometimes see partnerships happen, but they really take a long time. And of course, you can make anything happen in probably in time. So I just wanted to get your view on the aspect of time and speed. Thank you. It's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, I, have a question. Yeah. I have a question for Bimpe. On, uh, in your example about Nigeria, how do you actually steer the industry or the private sector into the direction that your nutritious food agenda is so basically how do you stimulate them to focus on certain aspects of your nutrition nutritious food agenda and not on on other pieces thank you and um, um there's two more over here and then we'll turn it back to the panel jane and Jane Benham, independent consultant. Uh, thank you to the panel. I think a lot of what we're doing here is talking and preaching to the converted. So I want to put to the panel, how are we going to engage those who aren't converted, who are radically anti-partnerships? And perhaps, Lawrence, that was to your point of how uh, Lauren is the WFP dealing in a UN system that has a lot of anti-partnership views. Thank you, Jane. Key question. Okay, Joanna from ICRASAT. Um, I, this may relate slightly to the gentleman's question about delicious food. I was just wondering how much effort people are putting into the consumer-driven end of it, uh, rather than only the production side, and how much we're driving diversity and new foods, like Alina mentioned, the finger millet, uh, rather than just the big three, how can we bring in that diversity along with the other crops through a more consumer-driven approach, and if people are actually taking that approach as well. Thank you, great set of questions. Panelists, brief comments, questions on any of that? Here we go, I'm, I'm gonna try with two of the questions and maybe a third, and I'll try and bundle some in. 
Uh, let me start with deliciousness because that's close to my heart. I love food and I'm in the capital of delicious food around the world. Um, we've learned the hard way that you can't sell nutrition. You can only sell food. And food's got to taste good and feel good. And, and let's be very clear, we're targeting the lowest the lowest and poorest rural smallholder. We're trying to target a billion people living beyond any imaginable poverty that, that, that we, we can imagine here in, in London. And yet, what we've learned is that we've got to target deliciousness as the value proposition. And I'll give you one example. In Zambia, we've developed a vitamin A enriched maize, the corn. Now in Zambia, most corn is white. And we, when we add vitamin A into the corn, it turns it bright orange. I wish I had one. I usually carry it with me, but uh, London Heathrow has rather tough customers. <laughs> um, it, it really goes bright orange. And so we had to overcome, how do we, how do we get people excited about eating orange maize? And we, we told the farmer, you grow this, it doesn't cost you anymore. It's just as high yielding, it's just as pest resistant, it's just as drought tolerant. So there's no trade-off. So the farmers are prepared to grow some of it. You tell the mother, this is gonna make your children's eyesight improve. We've seen improved night vision within a week of eating this enhanced maize. It's going to improve your children's health. But it was, wasn't until they actually started eating and cooking with it. And you know what has made it exciting and the reason why it's successful is because it tastes good. It tastes better than white maize, it cooks better than white maize. Zambian smallholder rural farmers are consumers, just like you and I. They want their food to be exciting and they want it to be delicious. So I agree with you, deliciousness is really important. Very quickly, time. Oh, uh, I'm impatient. I can't bear the fact that 370,000 women around the world are going to watch their children go blind this year. I can't bear the fact that 82% of toddlers in India are going to suffer from an irreversible cognitive disability because they're not getting enough eye in their diet. I don't have time to get partnerships 100% right and that's why I believe in the coalition of the willing. Let's just get the job done with a small number of people and then scale it. Thank you. Um, I think I have one direct question, and maybe I can attempt to answer one or two other more. The direct question is actually asking how we can steer the industry to focus on nutritious food uh, production. Um, actually, we do that a lot through regulation, and um, we have the uh, National Agency for Food and Drugs Administration and Control. It's a specific agency for regulating um, foods. And there is no um, packaged food in Nigeria that does not uh, ha have NAVDAC. The short form of that agency is NAVDAC. And if you don't have NAVDAC um, uh, approval, it cannot be displayed in the market. It, 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 government um, makes it, gets the information to the, to the populace that it is not supported by government and um, anybody who um, is interested in his or her health will not go for a food that cannot be guaranteed by, by government. Although what we, um, the problem we should be addressing now is to um, see how we can help the small and medium um, skilled enterprises to get more into the production of, um, of uh, nutritious food because um, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of them involved in uh, food uh, vend as, as food vendors, and um, uh, it is a huge um, population that patronizes them. How can we get more of this, uh, uh, more of the uh, businesses into um, 
foods that will be regulated by NADAC. I think that's what is a concern now. For the ones that get into the market packaged, they are regulated. Um, also, we have incentives for the big uh, businesses, you know, like I told about entry and uh, exit of goods and, uh, and, and persons and um, registration of businesses and all that. We have the enabling environment for them. Um, the role of time and speed in partnership. Yes, depending on the, uh, the partnership, if you want a lasting, sustained partnership, you need to give it time. You need to give it a, a lot of um, roles and responsibility definitions, a lot of um, uh, resource mobilization, capacity building, and all that will get you to the uh, destination of uh, the objective of the partnership. So um, you may not really have a one size uh, fits all time and um, speed, but depending on the um, acceptable standards of the kind of uh, objective that you want to achieve. I think I can. Did you pass too long? I think that's a good segue. I don't know if I can agree with both of you. <laughs> yes, I like the coalition of the willing when it comes to speed and time, and I'm often impatient. But I think, I think you've got it right here as well. We need to play the long game. Partnerships take time. We can't go on a donor funding cycle of one year because it takes longer than that to really get down into the hard work and the changes that we need to make. So I agree with both of you, but uh, I, I say we've got a plan to play the long game. Uh, very much so. Um, let's see, I'll take the easier one first, but it's uh, not a, a, an easy question in itself. Finger millet. No, it's not in the food basket of the World Food Program, but you know what's happening? is that there are so many new foods out there that we've had to create what's called, a, we call it, the New Foods Committee. Um, and food applicants, whether it's in the private sector or uh, even government, bring new ideas for foods that should be part of a nutritious food basket to the World Food Program. And you know, the thing has evolved so much, the evolution of, of food aid to food assistance, is that often we'll approve a food that we don't actually procure. So we have try and keep a limited food basket where we can assure the quality and all the micronutrients that go into it, whatever it happens to be. But we really had to look at it and say, you know, maybe our uh, high energy biscuits aren't quite right for Asia. Maybe they would prefer a noodle product or, or something like that. And as we move more into cash and voucher, we can say, look, maybe we're not gonna buy it, but with a voucher, if it's a good quality product, why can't we hand them a voucher so that they can buy things that might be more germane to a, a local uh, culture? Uh, more close to natural, uh, to their traditional eating uh, habits. Let's go in that direction. So in that way, we're looking at a mu many more new foods, and we're trying to be much more in tune with advancements, both in terms of quality and nutrition and safety, but also relating to the new problems that we're seeing related to overweight and obesity, and maybe there are better products out there. Um, so, not in the food pot, food basket, but definitely something that would be considered. The non-converted, Jane always asks the hard questions. Um, I, I, I think we're not finding it easy with WHO, but we've done, and I was laughing because it was very much, uh, there was a couple of proverbs today about something about the camel being inside the neck inside the tent or whatever I'm sure I didn't get them right 
but definitely with WHO, we've started a uh, partnership dialogue between WFP and WHO. And uh, basically, we both agreed that WFP is more practical and that we cannot abide by one set of guidelines because we want to adhere to the situation on the ground that makes sense. But that we, have, we overall believe in the same set of principles. For example, WFP's put out a new directive on um, enforcing the code, on guidelines on uh, breastfeeding. Um, we are talking about uh, private sector uh, partnership for NCDs, things like that. So I think we're creating a dialogue, no easy solutions, um, but I think we've got to keep it, it going on a regular basis, and this one may be one that takes a little bit of time. Thank you, Lauren. Let me pass to Alvay. Thank you. Um, just quick ones. Um, I think uh, who convene uh, the partnership matters a lot. But I've come to learn, you know, depending on who and at what level maybe the government is, is very important. If I call the head of the Tanzania Private Sector Foundation, he will come immediately. But if he's called by maybe another ministry which is, they may be a little bit, you know, he can ask a question, but me will not ask me a question. He will come straight. So where the convener is matters a lot to create this partnership. And make, because they know for me, if they ask me to, give, to help them anything in the government, I can easily also do more than the nutrition. You know? So I think that one is, is very important. And um, we need to create even consumer awareness as the way of demanding even if it's a nutritious food from the from the from the you know from the market. If so they are aware so everybody will tend to comply and engage and be the part of the partnership which makes the the, the good diet uh, to come in the market. And I think we don't in, in, in terms of the WHO, the the, the others who are really non converters I think really, again, I see the role of the government. If I have promised to deliver nutritious food in the market, I need to be re-elected in five years. So anybody who is preventing me from doing that, I will show him the evidence this thing is working. So there is not the Republic of WHO, there is not the Republic of WFP, there is the Republic of Tanzania. Is the one who's going to be voted next, next time. So we need to show that, guys, this thing is working. So we need to become part and parcel of which I'm going to be judged in five years as the government. The WFP is not going to be voted, right? Thank you. Okay, I'm the last again. Um, so uh, three answers. Um, the first one on the delicious. I think we, we normally we call this aspirational food. Uh, I think that if you want to make something sustainable, it has to be aspirational. People want to have it because of taste, because of color, because I mean I can share with my family, etc, etc. Um, so it's it's a demand creation that we have to look into. It. Normally when you talk about partnership is more, um, what is it called, the farm to fork, but we need to start to look into it, the fork to farm. This is, this is something that we need to do. Uh, but make no mistake, uh, in emergency situations uh, we have to do what we have to do. It's better of having something than having nothing. I think that is that I want to just make sure that we are also in the same in the same page on that. Now the time, uh, the question on time. Uh, well, speed is very close to my heart in all the sense. Um, I think that um, yeah, sometimes um, 80, 20, or 60, 40 uh, plays a role. Um, but I think it's a combination of a long-term planning with short-term successes. We have a, a, um, a 10 years uh, um, joint partnership with the World Food Program, 10 years. And I can tell you from the beginning, it was not that easy. But again, I think once you, you propose something, make sure you deliver it. Make sure that it's measurable and make sure you communicate it. Sometimes somebody mentioned that, I mean, that we keep the, as a good secret. Oh, we were successful, but we were too humble to communicate. 
and this sometimes does not help. So again, I repeat here, it's long-term planning, but uh, short-term successes that need to be communicated. And Jane, I don't have an answer to you. <laughs> now, I think, I think that um, uh, we discussed this afternoon as well. I think um, um, I would rather go with people that are aiming to uh, and build successes uh, and then make the successes I mean, real, tangible, communicate them. And I think this is a, a, um, a great way to, to tackle the anti or the non-converters, whatever it's called that. So better, um, perhaps of my nature, I'm a little bit optimistic here, but better go with the people that want to do something because there will be always people that uh, mm -hmm. says, I mean, yeah, it's not good. Look at the color, look at the taste. I mean, it's the wrong food, etc. I mean, the cynics and the challengers, they are everywhere. If you don't want to have cynics and challenges around you, don't do anything. It's also simple. Thank you. Um, well, I don't think we've got... Oh, you're okay. Yes. Can I have a quick question? Yes, of course. Sorry. Um, okay. okay. I think we have a double challenge. Driving quality up while driving price down. The panel hasn't addressed the price issue. Um, one of the fastest growing areas, subsectors in, in food and agriculture is horticulture. But the stuff is too expensive. The unconverted um, tell us uh, do kitchen gardens, uh, grow the food in the village, and so on. And they also neg neglect price, um, or time use and derived price. Uh, can I push the panel to talk, or oh, Lawrence, can you push him a bit to talk about price? Uh, give us a good price and quality story. The double warming needs to be achieved. I don't know if I have time. Who am I looking at? Do I have time to do this? Let me try and let me give you a, an answer to that. Uh, and then I'll, anyone else would like to pick it up. You know, on, on horticulture, there are lots and lots of low-cost technologies think can actually drive down the price and drive up the productivity of horticulture. The big problem is around price variability um, due to climate. So a big part of it is about technology, but a big part of it is about the enabling environment that government can put in place to mitigate these this price variability. But I have I have asked myself the same question. Why isn't why aren't lots of companies piling into this space? Because it's the one the fruits and vegetable space is the one sort of unequivocal, it's good for all forms, preventing all forms of malnutrition. Um, so, but anyone else like to pile into this? The Dutch moved into Tanzania. Very quick one is really the creation of incentives. The government may, if they see this is an important product, but unaffordable, why don't you create incentive, give incentive to, to these producers which will, fiscal incentive for that matter, which will lower their cost of production and probably regularly, uh, uh, monitor to, to, to make sure that the price reflects also that cost, unless you'll be given the incentive which is not working for the population. So that's one of the suggestions. Mm -hmm. So I agree on incentives, but I also think that, I mean, uh, once you enter in this price debate, uh, it's, it's very tricky. We should look always in efficiency cost benefit. This is this is the right way to evaluate the different programs and different possibilities that what we can do. Sometimes it's very difficult because people are comparing, but I think the incentives, I mean, in order to, for instance, if you start what we are doing now in AIF in, in, in Rwanda, I mean, if you don't have the right incentives there, you run the risk again because of competitiveness. At the end of the day, it has to be competitive. It has to have the right effectiveness in the field. But if you lack at the beginning the right incentives, it will be very difficult to be successful. So it's about creating the demand incentives, but it's also, also a lot of it is about uh, agricultural research and development. There isn't much ag R&D around vegetables and fruits, not public sector right. stuff anyway, because that would, that would increase the productivity, increase the profitability, lower the input prices, increase um, all sorts of things, and lower the output prices too. Uh, very quickly, I'm not an economist, and so I wouldn't dream of trying to answer a question from such an esteemed <laughs> policy economist. I, I think it's as much about affordability as it is about price. Price is rel relative. Um, and so if we can tackle poverty 
and, and make sure that people can actually afford a choice. I, I feel if we can focus on, on poverty alleviation through nutrition and through agricultural technologies, that, that should be a, a bigger goal. And I, I still, I don't have all of the answers, but what I am seeing is that we're, through Harvest Plus, a very small program delivering 12 crops that are at the same cost, the same input investment that a farmer would be putting into a non-nutritious crop. I think if you can do it for those, you should be able to do it for everything else. It's about affordability. And I think what we've got to do is demonstrate that it is possible to use agricultural technology, extension services, um, a combined partnership approach to lift rural farmers out of poverty and then affordability becomes a different a different ball game if we focus on the input costs and the price of the, the price gap between the staple crops and the vegetables i just feel like that gap's getting bigger and bigger and therefore we've got to focus on what makes people's lives better what what makes how do we empower people to lift themselves out of poverty uh, I, I don't have the answers but that, that's uh, it's a, a huge problem um, I think I'll come in. I'm not an economist, but um, I know that competition in the markets actually has a role to play in driving down uh, prices. And um, I go from the example of telecommunications in Nigeria. When it was introduced in the year 2000, it was very huge cost to, to get a telephone line, but now it's almost free. The market women, the farmers, the petty traders, everybody holds at least one set. Some people hold two, three handsets. And um, if government plays its role in regulation and creating an enabling environment for businesses to, to come, there will be competition. And before you know it, the prices will go down without compromising quality. But in your example, the demand was very strong for the mobile phones, right? Yeah. So yeah. that also has to be... Yeah. Do you want to pass it to you? I, I don't okay. think I have anything. Do you mind if I just, well, I you've have the mic. I, I feel that we didn't really fully answer the question about transparency and accountability at the other end of the curve. And although my organization is focusing very much on undernutrition and, and, and hidden hunger, I think what we've learned is it's the same spectrum. That those children that are growing up stunted and lacking in zinc and iron and vitamin A are also the most likely to then be obese. And I think the more that we work on, on the science of the spectrum of malnutrition, companies that are producing food at any end of that spectrum need to, to be accountable to both ends. And, and what we're seeing, I, I'm reassured, is that we all understand that a bit better, that, that companies recognize that, especially the larger global companies, they're on that, they're, they're part of a spectrum of nutrition. And they may be selling foods that are only affordable to those that are one end of it, but actually they have an accountability uh, to those that are at the other end of the spectrum as well. And I, I take comfort from the fact that I'm seeing change and that change is coming about through partnership. So I just wanted to pick that up because I don't think it was addressed. Lawrence. Thank you, Bev. I'm gonna I'm going to go ahead. I can't Sorry. refuse you. You've got the mic and you work with me. So go ahead. <laughs> I know where you live. You do. Um, so, <laughs> so I'd like, to, I'd like to go back to this affordability question. Briefly, though. Yeah? yeah, briefly. We need to recognize that these fruits and vegetables are enormously perishable. It's not just going from the farm and into the mouth. Mm -hmm. That entire infrastructure needs supporting. So when we're talking about private sector and private sector partnerships, you're not talking just about the production end or the consumption end. It's the entire supply chain we need to enable for fruits and vegetables. And that requires unusual partners, unusual partners, warehousing companies, refrigeration companies. We need to bring those folks to the table for nutrition. We lose 50% of the tomato in Nigeria. 50%. What does that do to the price? What does that do to the dose of vitamin A that could be available for children? These are our challenges. Thanks, Bonnie. We, we know post-harvest loss is nutrition and nutrient loss, not just food loss. 
Um, thank you. I'm going to make a couple of comments and then pass it over to Vinita. You're pointing at me. Is there time for one more? There is. Go ahead. Um, I'm curious. Oh, I'm Kristen from Gates Foundation. I'm curious about um, with the expectation that the informal markets are going to be remaining dominant as a source uh, for smallholder farmers and other rural populations. How do you think about engaging those like more local businesses in the public-private sphere to increase affordability and um, supply of nutrient-rich foods? Anyone on the panel like to pick that one up? Let, let me let me try. I mean, I, mean, I think we we met, didn't we, earlier this about a month ago? Um, you know, Gain is working, and, and Bonnie and her team pioneered this this model with our country directors. Um, we are working with small and medium enterprises to increase their ability to get nutritious and healthy food to the market. And it's not because those companies are so nutritionally conscious or have a shared business, a shared value model, it's because they happen to be producing things that are part of a healthy diet. So whenever those companies come to us, whether it's in the Sun Business Network or the marketplace, and say, we would like to increase our share of the market, we would like to increase our reach, we would like to drive our price down to get to the bottom of the pyramid, we will say to them, what, what do you need? Make the case for what you need, and very often they need bit of cash to buy a bit of equipment and they need some advice around business models, they need connections to make connections with other businesses, business to business. They sometimes need um, the ability to navigate and negotiate complex government rules. So there, there are a bunch of things they need uh, in these very informal markets to, to potentially grow into the, the bigger markets. The thing that's really stopping us, uh, Kristen, is missing middle in finance. So we can provide them with some initial finance and tech and know-how to get them to a certain level. And we haven't done the analysis yet, Bonnie, about what happens after we leave. We haven't. We suspect they keep going up, but we don't know. We've got some anecdotal evidence, but not hard evidence. But some of them, for sure, are going to be going back down to their initial level. And it's because they can't get access to more formal finance. There's this missing middle um, that we need to, to figure out. Would anyone else like to talk about that topic? No. So I'm going to, I'm going to, time's getting on and we need to end this soon and I want to pass over to Vinita. But I wanted to just quickly uh, mention, uh, respond to Anishri's comment, question. Because I think you, you talked about what do we do about the other end, the, the more controversial parts of the value chain. The bit I really struggle with is the companies that are doing great things to reduce undernutrition and prevent undernutrition, but they're also doing things that make sugar and salt and trans fats cheaper and more available. And I think that's a real dilemma. I have, we haven't figured that one out at all, it seems to me. And, the, and on Jane's point, you know, I'm, I'm pretty naive about these things, but I, I think there are some people who, just as I said earlier, think business has got, has got all the answers. There are some people who think, you know, forget it. And there's a big group in the middle. The question is, how do you segment that group in the middle? Are there some people who are actually responsive to, actually, this worked. Here's, here's a story of something that actually worked. I want to take that and I want to adapt that. And then there may be another group in the middle that says, that kind of follows the herd. You know, oh, this seems like a good thing. All these people are doing it. Maybe we should try it. So I don't know, but that middle area. But the thing I do know is that we need to get out of our comfort zones and talk to some of those people, it's, well, and only really talk to them when they're an impediment to the things we want to do. Some people are never going to change their mind. It's like the cognitive dissonance. It's the people who believe the UFOs are going to come and land on a certain day, and when they don't land on a certain day, they come up with a reason for why they're not landing on that day, and then they say, well, they'll come another day. Uh, there's a lot of that in our, in our field. We've got to try to segment that and parcel that and then avoid it if we can. But there are some people who really, we do need to try and convince because they're stopping us doing key things. So I want to uh, finish with two points that came up in the, in the panel. One is a point raised by Bev and actually raised by the other panelists in more implicit ways. And that is that individuals matter. Individuals can make a difference. I'm a firm believer in that. Um, one difficult choice, one difficult partnership, 
one thing that you decided to do that is not easy, um, that can make a difference, um, we can build on that. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, nevertheless, think about the powerful forces that are arrayed together to create malnutrition. We need equally powerful forces to come together to overcome it. So in that spirit, I would like to pass over to our chair of our board, Anita Bowen. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, to you and all the panelists. Um, and I think what was very clear, uh, I'm certainly not going to attempt to summarize what was said, but what was very clear was that we do require this diversity of thought and conviction in action if we are going to solve um, even a little bit the huge problem of malnutrition and undernutrition. Um, you know, we got perspectives from the private sector, we got perspectives from development agencies, from the governments, and so on. But I think at the end of the day, I'll pick up on what you said, Lawrence. Um, it's about individuals, and I think it is also about individual conviction. Uh, one of the issues that, you know, I don't come from the nutrition world, I come from the world of business and food, and not necessarily all healthy food. Uh, but you know, as I've thought about nutrition, I think one of the big issues the community of nutritionists, uh, you know, from economists to everybody else has to do is to make nutrition simple to understand. I think it's a very complex topic. Uh, I can go to someone and say, you know, get your kid va vaccinated and it'll prevent whatever. Uh, I don't have a simple explanation for explaining nutrition. And, uh, you know, because it is a complex subject and because it sits on the periphery of so many things, it's not the center of anything. You know, it's impacted by awareness, by education, by access to, uh, you know, good quality drinking water, access to primary health care, and there are so many other factors that come together that I think one of the challenges in building partnerships really is, can we figure out a way of making nutrition understandable, palpable, more comprehensible, uh, you know, to people who are impacted by it? I can't think of anybody who says, I'm gonna go on a diet or I'm gonna put my kids on a diet which is really unhealthy. Uh, you know, we do things because we actually don't know. So I think one of the challenges of partnerships is, you know, how do we simplify the whole concept of nutrition in behavior terms? Part of it is going to be demand-led, but I do believe that the private sector, the government, development agencies have a responsibility, and that is to impact the supply side. Because, uh, you know, if I'm a consumer, I would turn around and say, I don't know what I don't know. But if you give me a good quality product that tastes good and is nutritious, you know, if people are spending their hard-earned money on buying cell phones, they are doing it because they see value in a cell phone. If people see value in certain qualities of food, uh, you know, they will change their behavior. So I do believe that partnerships is the answer. I think this panel has more than adequately exemplified that. But I do believe uh, all of us who care about nutrition, who are convinced that there is a solution to this, it's not an easy solution, but we will spend our time, effort, intellect, and everything else that we've got to addressing it. I do believe we've got to simplify the problem and, and actually explain it in behavior terms um, and foster alliances uh, of people who have the courage of their conviction and are willing to act on the basis of that conviction. So with that, I thank all of you uh, for being here with us today, for participating, for raising the questions that you have, and once again to all our panelists. And I do believe that you know, when all of us walk away, even if we walk away with at least one thing that we are willing to uh, change, it will make a big difference. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.